Hi, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome. I can see that even before we've started, there's everybody bargaining for their place among the first 500. So relax. You are getting the book. Just hang in there and hang out with us for the whole time. Um, it's really good to see that kind of buzz. Um, over the last week, through Career Fest, we've had the opportunity to learn about different business units, what we do in India, how cool this work really is, and find out what it takes to succeed in these businesses. Also, what are the opportunities that you could possibly explore in other areas of work than you are right now? We've also heard from colleagues who've actually looked for roles internally and made moves. They've shared their success, their stories, their learning, and also managers whose team members have done so. Um, I think in some other really exciting opportunities, we opened up the chance for everyone to have a career conversation with a leader of their choice. And I'm told that within about 30 minutes of doing that, all the spots were taken. And um, towards, what was it, Wednesday, I think, we also had a chance to kind of pause, reflect on life, what drives and motivates us, what grit and determination really looks like, and how a positive mindset can make anything possible, while listening to Shalini Saraswati, who's a quadruple amputee and international runner who represents India. And you know, over this last week, over 2,000 of us have actively engaged with all these sources right through the week. So if you're one of those, I hope it's given you more to think about and act on. And so today, as we're rounding off this week, um, I have the pleasure to introduce Ravi Venkateshan with a really engaging and enlightening talk. I'm sure that you've already read about him, and if you didn't already know about him, you've figured it out. However, let me provide a brief introduction. Um, Ravi is the board chair of the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet and a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation. He's also the founder of the Global Alliance for Mass Entrepreneurship called GAME, a coalition which aims to create 10 million entrepreneurs in India by 2030. He's also previously served as board chair of Microsoft India, Bank of Baroda, and co-chairman of Infosys Limited. Ravi has, has a BTEC from IIT Bombay, an MS from Purdue, and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. If that's not enough, Ravi was also voted as one of India's best management thinkers by Thinkers50 and is Microsoft's Alumni Hero 2020. Okay, that's not all. He's also the author of two best-selling books, Conquering the Chaos, Win in India, Win Everywhere, and most recently, What the Heck Do I Do With My Life? And as you know, the good news is, plus 500 of you joining us today, you're gonna get a copy. So welcome, Ravi. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Amrita. Thanks for the fab introduction, more importantly, for giving me this opportunity to be in conversation with you. Oh, this is such a pleasure. It's a great way for us to wind off a week of all kinds of insights yeah. and exciting activities. Sounds like a most exciting week. It has been. So I, of course, read your book. It's sitting here right by me. I think it's going to become a bit of a reference point. Oh, there you are. I can show off mine as well. Here it is. <laughs> and like I told you, <clears throat> the first few pages as I flipped through, I was like, oh, my God, I have to say this. What the heck am I going to do with my life? And I know you also said very quickly, the idea is not to depress you. The idea is to give you ideas. So while I don't really want this whole conversation to be about the book and it'll be a spoiler for everyone else who's yet to get their hands on it. I think what you do extremely well at the beginning and that totally hooked me right at the start was when you, you know, talked about the fact that our careers are about a part of our whole lives. So let's begin with the way you see the world today, the changing macro environment, how different it looks, even in the last few years, maybe a decade, where are we and what really are we looking out to? Maybe then we'll follow up with some more uh, specific questions, but give us the big picture as you see it today. Yeah, in a, you know, that's really the thesis of my whole book, which is without any fanfare, without any announcement, the world has slipped into a whole new era. And the most defining thing about this period of time is extreme change. Just beyond belief. The world will change more in this century than in all of human history. And the, why this is happening is a convergence of multiple trends and forces, um, to name just a few of them. One of them, of course, is technology, which you, you all are uh, in the, at the forefront of, but technology is reshaping and disrupting the world. Another one is um, 
the, you know, the, the planet is imploding, the way we have treated and mis the planet misbehaved, uh, consumed unsustainably, uh, unsustainably is having its consequences. And whether it's climate change or, or, or the fact that we're in the midst of a mass extinction, that's a huge thing. A third one is polarization. We see um, polarization within every country. Clearly, you see it in, within India on any number of issues. You see polarization between countries. And the problem with such extreme polarization is it results in the lack of trust. And when you don't trust each other, you can't come together to solve problems. So that's a big issue. Then you have any extreme inequality, which is structural. And it's not just in India, it's in every part of the world. And that inequality is actually widening and that is going to create lots of issues. There's demographics, so on and so forth. But so, you know, the idea of a perfect storm is when multiple storm fronts come together and create something, you know, explosive. That's what's happening. Now, when you have so much change, there's good news and bad news. It's not all bad news. The good news is change also throws up extraordinary opportunities. So, if you're in the right geography, in the right zip code, um, if you've got the right skills, the right mindset, this is an extraordinary time to be alive. And you look at, I think most of the people who are in this conversation are part of that small group that's incredibly lucky. Um, but then for most people, this is going to, so much change is an adaptive challenge. It's going to be a struggle to cope with so, so much. And you can see it for ourselves. If you see what's happening uh, around us, right? We had COVID. COVID's not yet over. I just got sick last week in New York, so I know it's alive and well. Um, then you have the economic consequences of COVID in the form of supply chains, inflation, uh, you know, multiple economies dipping into recession. Um, you've got fragile economies, including our neighbor Sri Lanka imploding. India itself is not in particularly good economic shape. You've got the war in Ukraine. You don't know how that's going to end, but that's tearing the world apart. I mean, you can just go on. We've had the hottest summer in history, right? With temp surface temperatures crossing 65 degrees in many parts of India, floods in the Northeast. My God. And we're just, this is nothing. This is a pale preview of what is to come. So the point here is, look, be aware of what's going on. Because if you're not aware and if you're not intentional about, uh, you know, the choices you make in, at such a time, chances are you could end up like this little guy here. And for those of you who can see, that's T-Rex. And um, so the, the whole point is, if you're able to adapt, you're going to flourish. If you can't adapt to so much change, you're going to really struggle. And so read the book. That's true. In fact, I was actually going to refer, when I read all of this, that was my first thought. Okay. You're making me think about the world around me to be more responsible in the choices I make of how I will lead my life, grow my career, all of that. And I yeah. think you ask very early on a very pertinent question about, do you have the skills that are going to be relevant in the future? Because a lot of what we talk about, and I'll admit a lot of what we've spoken about even this week as we talk about you know, the career fairs, are I'm not sure how far into the future those skills are relevant, the ones we've been talking about. Tell us a little more about what you mean about the skills you have that are relevant for the future. Yeah. Look, this issue of skills is a very dynamic one. It's a moving goalpost. What's hot and relevant today is commoditized and obsolete tomorrow, right? So it's notably true for today, the all, new programming languages, data science, you know, machine learning, that's all the rage. Five years, yeah, it's, it's a feature. And you, you know, and so some new skills are going to be important. And because of the rate of change, it's, you know, the jobs of the future are still being invented. So how do you figure out what skills you need? You just simply have to constantly learn what's, what's relevant, what'll keep you relevant. So in my book, I focus on, well, if that's the case, are there any durable skills, you know, which are more foundational which if you come back 50 or 100 years from now, are still incredibly important. So I thought about that and I said, I came to the conclusion that there are four of these sort of foundational or meta skills or super skills. 
And the first one of them is learning agility. And learning agility is not what it sounds, which is simply learning and going online and learn something new. Uh, it's actually the ability when you're confronted with a situation that you've never dealt with, okay, which is completely outside your experience zone, to not crumple, but learn how to first adapt, then flourish. Okay, so if you look at, looked at a shock like COVID, uh, many people got crushed, but some people actually learned how not only to survive, but to prosper. So that's, that's the sort of mindset and skill that you need. The second critical thing is an entrepreneurial mindset. Now, not everybody is going to be an entrepreneur, okay? But given the fluidity of the world around us, you need to think like an entrepreneur and know how to act like an entrepreneur, even if you're working in a nice big corporation like Adobe, okay? And so if you think about what does an entrepreneur do? Well, one of the first things they are able to do is spot opportunity and then act on it, okay? Another thing is they're very resourceful. So every entrepreneur starts out without almost without any resources, but they're able to bootstrap themselves. So in this world, resourcefulness matters more than resources. Another one is problem solving, storytelling, tenacity. These attributes are very important. So entrepreneurial mindset is two. Number three is people skills. And this is one of those paradoxical things. Even as more and more jobs are getting automated, the world is being more and more driven by technology, it turns out our, we, our people skills become more and more a differentiator. And there's this uh, project I uh, pulled out from Google where Google looked in you know, three, four years ago at who are the most successful people, who are the most successful Googlers, and what makes them successful. And it turns out not to be the you know, technical skills. It turns out to be a whole bunch of things like the ability to work in teams, communicate, problem solve, the things that make us human. So even as there's more AI, we have to learn to be more distinctively human. So that's three. And the fourth one is leadership, the ability to lead by influence and get others to follow you to accomplish great things. So these sorts of skills are, I think, way more important as the world is changing in these extraordinary ways. Wow. Thanks. That was also a good recap for me because I remember thinking about it saying, you know, we I wonder if we're doing this all right or a little bit wrong when we talk about building skills that feel like the hard skills versus yeah, the much yeah. softer ones. The softer skills oh. are, are paradoxically the things that are more and more important. And here's the problem, Amrita. These soft skills cannot be learned in a classroom. They cannot be taught online they can only be learned experientially, okay? So, and that too, they are learned best through what, what I call crucible experiences, and we can talk more about it. So, um, and schools and colleges do a lousy job uh, helping us learn these things. And I don't think many companies do a great job either because the emphasis is on those harder skills, technical skills. Yeah, that's that's so true. And, you know, the crucible experiences, we talked about this earlier as well. You know, we often hear, you know, I have, I've heard myself say this and I know there are other people who feel the same way. About two years or three years of having done the same thing, you start to hear this yeah. thing in your head. OK, I've been doing this for a while now. What else shall I do? It's a kind of restlessness. It's a feeling of um, needing to do something which you feel probably will change the scene. And I'll also admit that a lot of times we do talk about breadth of experience and the importance to gain a variety of experience. But I know when you talk about crucible of experience, you, you frame it quite differently. So why don't you share what that is, how we can think about it that way? Look, I think it is very tempting in a fast changing world with all the social media, et cetera, to get tempted to wanting to constantly do something new. If you're not, in motion, it feels like you're getting left behind. So I look around me and there are an awful lot of people who, you know, every two years want to do something different, either within the same organization or outside. And a lot of it is because they feel they're getting left behind. Uh, every time you make a move, there's obviously a little bit of a salary bump. And so it's also, there's an incentive to, um, to do this. And yeah, we also like learning new things. So you say, oh, well, I've 
that's one pathway. But I'll tell you what has worked much better for me. And I think that is still true or even more true today, which is to every now and then take on a completely new challenge, a very big challenge, and then spend the next few years thereafter making a success of it. Okay, and this is what I'm calling a crucible experience. A crucible, you know, when you think about how you make steel, essentially you, you throw together, you know, uh, iron ore and coke and limestone, which is flux and some alloys, and then you heat it very, very high temperature, and then it melts and then you get steel. So it's the same thing. It is through these kinds of incredibly intense experiences that we actually grow. So when I think about, look back at my, you know, 30 some years of professional life, I can say that what were the crucible experience? Well, going to America for graduate studies and living the immigrant experience there for 10 years and established, that was a crucible experience. I think coming back to India and leading a transformation of my first uh, business, which was diesel engines and so forth, Cummins was a crucible experience. Shifting to Microsoft, a completely different industry and a tough company, and then learning to, or helping build Microsoft in India was a crucible experience. I think Bank of Baroda was a crucible experience because I didn't know anything about banking. So when you periodically say, I'm gonna take on a huge new challenge, it's completely beyond my skills and comfort zone, and then I'm gonna make a success of it. That's how you develop leadership skills. That's how you uh, grow in self-confidence. You accomplish something big, and so you build a reputation, and then people can point to that and say, wow, okay, we better be talking to Ravi now or Amrita now. And so you end up making not these little, little steps every two years, but much bigger leaps every five or seven years. And eventually, I think that turns out to be a, a path, a better pathway for extraordinary impact and success. So, you know, it's interesting because one of the six core values at Microsoft, which, you know, influence, core value number three is take on big challenges and see them through. This was written 25 years ago, but that's the essence of what I'm talking about. And you don't always have to leave a company to do that, right? You can be in a large company like Adobe and you can say, no, I'm going to do some, go, go work in a completely different group or a different function or a different part of the world. Uh, and you can, you know, do, do that to a fair extent. So I'm, I'm not here saying you have to leave uh, what you love doing or the place that you love in order. But I think this is a very different way to approach your life and career and one that has worked well for me. But it's not the only pathway. Yeah. No, that's that's really interesting. I think some of the imagery you've talked about, Ravi, about the steps, for example, you know, when you talk of careers, the image that comes to mind is a staircase and it looks very, every step looks exactly the same, distance, height, everything. Yeah, yeah. That's not what you're saying. No, it's not what, no, I'm, not saying. what I'm saying. I, there's a bit of an echo here. But um, uh, I've actually reminded uh, about, a, with, about a conversation I had in 2010 as I was writing my last book, Amrita. I was interviewing Lena Nair. Lena then used to be the head of HR for Hindustan Unilever. And um, those of you who followed the news, she's now the CEO worldwide for Chanel. It was yeah. a very exciting business. So, but Lena was a tremendously visionary HR leader. And she said, look, there are two ways um, that you rise in an organization. One is an escalator, like in a mall, you know, it's like the shack. And the other one is an elevator. So you get into an elevator and press 30th floor and you zoom up. And she says, um, as a large organization, we have to have an escalator for most people. And then we need to have an elevator for a few who have extraordinary ambition, extraordinary um, potential. OK, and so, you know, I'm one of those impatient people. I, I, I couldn't take the escalator in the organizations I was uh, part of. So I said, let me get into the elevator. And that's what we're talking about here. I think the elevator approach, when, I, when you briefed me for this conversation, you talked about what you're doing in career week. And I said, wow, this is amazing. I don't know many companies who do this. 
But, you know, I never would have come to a career thing and applied for jobs and all that. I think what worked for me was a very different approach. That's not to say it's the only approach, but this is the elevator versus escalator, which is number one, take charge of your career. Nobody else will. Don't expect your manager to do it. Don't expect company to do it. You better take charge. The second thing is don't ever read your job description. Okay. It's you in the moment, in the situation, figure out what needs to be done and try and accomplish that. And usually that's what really matters and that's what people will eventually appreciate and reward. The third one is really an important idea here, which is don't chase jobs. Get to a place where hiring managers and jobs are chasing you. Okay, and in the book, I actually, I don't know if you read that part where I said, look, um, you're trying to catch a mouse which has entered your living room. Don't try to chase him down. You know, it's, you're never going to succeed. The only way to succeed is put something tasty out there and let it come to you. So it's the same when it comes to jobs and opportunities. You have to become so interesting and attractive that recruiters are coming to you, hiring managers are coming to you, opportunities are attracted to you instead of you having to go out there and apply for these doggone things. Um, I think that's a way better strategy. And so we can unpack in the Q&A, how do you actually do that if there's any interest? And then the last bit is this take on big challenges, which are transformational. And that's how you build a reputation. That's how you build your capability. That's how you accomplish great things. Anyway, long answer, but I'm, I think what we're trying what to we're do trying here to is, do is just set up some ideas and then people can then react and ask questions and so forth. I'm going to be stuck on the mouse in the house, who's probably also the hiring manager you're trying to tempt. But it is such a good reframing of making your capabilities attractive to other opportunities versus the other way around, right? And working towards that, um, you know, impetus for someone to look for you. We talk a lot about individuals being a brand, right? And how you build that brand, therefore how you're known for what you do has somebody who should be fighting over you to say, I want this person in my team. There's a lot of that. And the other thing about Adobe is that we're known to be an organization that's high on relationships. Mm -hmm. Everyone who joins us first in the first few weeks or months will say, this is the one thing I found out about you. So whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or both, it's definitely something that everybody experiences. And then we talk about growing your career. We're also saying you've got to build a network of relationships. You actually <laughs> talk a lot about this. And then there's this counter argument from a lot of people who say, I know that's true, but it's just not my thing. I can't go out there and build these relationships. And so I've been okay so far. I don't think I really want to do this. This is not the way for me. So, you know, what's your take on this? What's other ways of looking at this piece about relationships and networks? I think more than ever before, networks are crucial because we're living in a networked world. Okay. And, um, your networks, in fact, shape your life. So I they, write quite a bit about this in my book. And in fact, there's this marvelous piece of um, research which says six networks shape what happens to you, you in your life. And these six, some of the six networks are the family you're born into and that network. Then your high school and the people you hang out with in high school. Why is that important? Because that shapes your definition of what is success and what you strive for. If you hang out with a bunch of athletes, you're going to go to be drawn in that direction or whatever. The third one is who you end up choosing to spend your life with, you know, your spouse, because his or her networks then become important. The city where you live in, you know, and that opens up sets of, so these six networks determine two things. One, what you believe, what you consider important. For instance, if you're in Bangalore, you're going to be attracted towards entrepreneurship because that's the dominant ethos out here. Everybody is building a startup of some sort. And the second thing is it determines what opportunities come your way. So if you want to change your life, this guy says, change your networks. Okay. 
Now, this is an incredibly important thing. Sometimes I ask uh, if there's time, I get audiences like this to do a little exercise. So I say, oh, write down the most defining experiences in your life or oh, joining Adobe or whatever, things like that. Then I say, who are the most important people who've shaped your life? Seven, eight names. Then I ask them to say, okay, each of these things, did you go make it happen or did it enter your life? Okay, and by the time you're 40 or 50, you look at this, 80% of things entered your life. Okay, the, that's not some mystical thing. It's not spirituality. It's your networks. They entered your life through your networks. So why I talk about this is, you better, the larger and broader and more strategic your networks, the, the more opportunities you attract. So um, there are three types of networks, it turns out. One is personal networks. So the fact that you and I are having this conversation is because we live nearby and we're part of a personal network. Then there are operational networks. You're working at Adobe and you work with a set of people. That's a, yeah, that's an opera. But the most important are strategic networks. Okay, and so you need to build these, in, they don't happen by accident. You have to intentionally go out and build these things. And for those of you who like, um, to, uh, you know, a little bit of mathematics, it's a network graph. And the shape of that graph has to be both broad and deep. Okay, so Facebook friends don't count. Okay, so meaningful relationships with great breadth is very important. And that is not an accident. You have to work intentionally at it. And you can't say, it's, I don't like it. It's unnatural. Actually, I, it's unnatural for me too. I'm an introvert. I enjoy nothing more than hanging out with myself or a couple of friends and dogs. But no, you have to do these things. Okay? It's an effort, like learning a new skill or whatever. And by the way, Amrita, this networks is actually only one aspect of a set of related things, which I call intangible assets, which you better develop. And the other things are your reputation, your professional reputation. Who knows you? Does anybody even know you exist? And what are you good at? So that's one. Expertise, okay? Your core friends and family, and your, your beliefs and your spirituality. So these are the set of things that will protect you when you have shocks, and these are the things which will help, which is the currency as you try to move from A to B to C. So I cannot tell you how important it is that you be intentional about this and work on building your networks. There's of course a downside. Everywhere in life you'll find people who are just consummate networkers. They enter a room and they're just looking at who's the most important person in the room and they go make a beeline and, try, and strike up something superficial, moving basically schmoozing. That's, that's not what I am advocating, okay? I'm talking about meaningful strategic relationships. Again, we can unpack this uh, in the Q&A if we ever get to yeah, a Q&A. &A. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll stop asking you questions while I have a long list of them. There's quite a few here. But, you know, this, this idea of building those relationships works intentionally is really the key of it. Otherwise, the tendency to think of it, think about it as the losing part you talked about, to me personally, it's already tiring even just thinking about it. Um, but that's probably where it gets misunderstood is to that's what's expected. And it's very easy to find the, to spot the ingenuity of the, of the conversation if that's your only, you know, go-to way of building networks versus it being very intentional and intended. Now, thanks for that. There's a bunch of questions and lots of people are voting them up and saying we need to ask more. So let me first start with one of the highest voted ones for right now. Swati asks this. She says, people say you need to leave a role or company when you get comfortable, but isn't there always something to learn? Is there a new challenges coming up every now and then? How do we know when to leave the current role or company and move to the next? Yeah, it's a super question, very practical one. And to me, the, you know, the, the best uh, answer is what uh, Steve Jobs said in his famous commencement speech at Stanford, right? It says, if for too many days you get up and, you don't, and you're not enjoying what you do, okay, you, there's no spring in your step as you think about, you know, going to work, 
or doing what you do, then it's time to do something different. Okay, so that's one indicator when you're frustrated, bored, or you just hate it. Okay, you hate either, you know, some aspect of it. So that's an impetus for change. Another one is sometimes life gives you a kick and <laughs> forces you to change. So, you know, so there can be two stimulus. Uh, so I, I'll go back to 2010. I, I was in Microsoft. I hated what I was doing. I had accomplished whatever I set out to do in 2003. And the only reason I was hanging on is because I didn't know what else to do. And the salary was too good. The title was great. And I said, what am I going to do for an encore? And so I was grimly holding on. And I said, no, that's not a good enough reason. And I need to, um, you know, be more adventurous. And I looked within the organization because it's a large organization and there are lots of opportunities. And I said, is there anything I'd rather do here? And there wasn't. And so it was time to, you know, look outside. So I, I, I left Microsoft without a bird in hand. And I said, no, let me, uh, the only thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to be an employee anymore. I'm going to be a freelancer. I'm going to try different things, see what works. And so what I did, which I advocate in the book, is do a lot of micro experiments to figure out your next move. So, and those experiments can be within Adobe and it can be outside. Okay, the fortunate thing about a large organization like Adobe is there's enough interesting things and there's enough mobility that, you know, there's quite a bit you can explore within um, that canvas itself. But certainly you can do experiments that, you know, look, look outside as well. And you don't have to quit what you're doing in order to, so there's, I talk about micro experiments. And the very nature of that is you can, for instance, you say, oh, Maybe I like teaching. Well, maybe show up at a local college and, and start just taking some guest lectures and see whether you enjoy it, okay? And you may find you don't, okay? It was a nice idea. Oh, I want to go into the social sector and save the planet. Fine. Let's first start volunteering and put your feet in the water and then see whether you really enjoy it and you want to go deeper. Or you may realize, no, I actually love my the safety and comfort of a large organization. I just want to volunteer. So you'll do, oh, I want to join a startup. Well, go again, go start spending some time with a startup, with some friends who are doing, building something interesting and see whether that experience is really you. So you, by doing these low risk experiments, you can figure out which of these pathways are really for you. And of course you can do similar experiments within the organization as well. So that's how I would say that you figure it out. Wow, that's great. No, thank you. It makes a lot of sense to do low risk experiments, like you said. So you feel like you're trying, you're answering the question that's bubbling up in your head, but you're not yeah. necessarily yeah. rocking the boat before you answer it. So two things. First of all, you cannot answer it through just a mental exercise. You have to experiment and figure this stuff out experientially. And second is there's no need to take dramatic risk and you know rock the boat or plunge in. Many of us have responsibilities. You have families and things. Or you may be risk averse. So there are effective ways of figuring it out without being suicidal. Thanks. So while we're talking about these experiments, um, Rithik has a question which is, Management is a hot career choice today. I think what he means is people management. Um, will it remain this relevant and enticing in the future? And I'm particularly talking about middle management because this, you know, association with a career path that heads towards leading people in teams as something that is either the next step or a really exciting next thing to do. What do you think? Well, first of all, I think organizations are always going to have people, right? You're not going away. And we're going to have many more different types of work arrangements. Not everybody is going to be an FTE. You'll have many more gig workers, consultants, but somebody has to orchestrate work, okay? And therefore, I don't think people management and people leadership is going away. The much maligned middle manager is actually making a comeback now. 
<laughs> okay, so people used to malign the mid, mid level managers. What do they do? They don't do anything. They simply do forward emails, they're postmen, um, they're bureaucrats. Now people are realizing no, 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 effective people managers serve a very important function. When you looked at things like the great resignation, for instance, people leaving organizing, a lot of it was people fleeing ineffective people managers. <laughs> okay, and you could see the attrition rate differences between effect, good people managers and ineffective people managers. Same organization, same everything, but once somebody has an attrition rate of 30%, somebody is at 10%. Okay, so I think people managers, management, people leadership, more importantly, is going to be crucially important. The Google work showed that. But you have to decide whether that's your calling, okay? Not everybody is cut out to be a you know, people manager. Warren Buffett, for instance, talks a lot about this. You should see his hysterical videos. He says long ago he realized he hated managing people. Okay, and for him, success is, how do I spend the least amount of time on people issues? Okay, so you have to figure out, is this your game or not? I enjoy engaging with people, but I don't like people management because you know that means a lot of conflict and dealing with lots of you know <laughs> people issues which I don't but I enjoy engaging with people, inspiring them, getting them to work together to accomplish great things and so you have to decide whether that is for you or not. You shouldn't do it because that appears to be the path to rise in an organization, okay? Um, I, I think more and more, your success is going to determine, be determined by operating at the sweet spot of what you are good at, what you enjoy doing, and what the world needs, okay? And that doesn't always equate to being a people manager. Yeah, thanks. So that's that's definitely a great point of view because it is very difficult sometimes the world around you, society, friends, batchmates. My God, I hear this a lot about where my batchmates are versus me. I feel like it's a lot of pressure that um, I think we can do without sometimes because it clutters. There's yeah. a lot of noise in your head to make those choices. Can we spend one minute on this? Sure. I think one of the most important things in this turbulent time is to figure out what success really means to you. It is, and define it for yourself. And this is incredibly hard to do because we have been brought up some childhood conditioned to obey, to please, to do what others want. First your parents, then your teachers, then your manager, then society. And somewhere we've lost track of what it is that's important to me. Okay, and that's why we are, there is so much dissonance out there, so much unhappiness, because most of us are living somebody else's life. And no matter how successful you are, you look around you and somebody is way more successful. Okay, somebody is managing bigger organization, making more money, has more followers on Instagram, whatever dimension of success you choose to make matter, somebody, there are many people who are ahead of you. And so if you want to escape from this insanity, this rat race, you have to, by the time you're midlife, you need to start figuring out what success means to you. And that's one of the hardest things, at least for me, it was damn hard. You know, I started working on this at 45, I'm now 59. It has taken me about 15 years to redefine success in more authentic terms, because I too was, you know, playing to the galleries. And I think it's, we can again unpack it, but there's quite a lot in the book. We've probably run out of time. 500 of you are going to get the book. Uh, so go read it. There's enough out there. Yes, that's true. Actually, as you talk about, you know, what's around you and the noise that we're talking about, you know, Sharad's asked a question. Clearly, there are many more people who have the same thing on their minds, which is what do you think of the internet startups playing a valuation game instead of creating long term sustainable value? And here's, I think, the reason why this question is coming as well. Aren't we over celebrating the rise of startups when very few of them have been able to create sustainable business value? It's also a lucrative job opportunity for a lot of people. So how do we read what's going on? What, I think what you should read is a bubble that's collapsing. And 
um, that's what it was. Um, you know, privately, I, I doubt more than a third of the hundred unicorns are really unicorns. I think third might be generous. You know, in Microsoft, we used to have this term for called watermelons, which is on your scorecard. You know, the red, yellow, green, they're green on the outside and red on the inside. That's what I'd put most of these uh, startups as. And, you know, as again, my good friend Warren Buffett, he said this beautiful thing in the 2008 recession. It's only when the tide goes out that you see who's swimming naked. Yeah. So a lot of the, I think the new realities are going to expose a, you know, and a lot of startups. We see that even a startup like Baiju's, which is valued at 25, 30 billion, hasn't done, hasn't produced its accounts for two years, which says that there's probably a lot that's going on underneath the surface. So I think, <clears throat> yeah, there's too much hype. There's driven by too much easy money. Um, but there are some very, very good companies that are being built. Um, I don't know, however, when I look at all the companies that are out there that I'm aware of, whether there is anyone trying to build the next Infosys. Infosys to me was one of the last extraordinary startups because it changed the game. It wasn't merely successful, okay? But it changed how we think about what's possible from India, it changed the way how the world saw us, Etc. It was just paradigm shifting. Microsoft was paradigm shifting. Okay, Google was paradigm shifting. I don't know how many paradigm shifting startups are out there in this mix. And unfortunately, today very few are trying to actually work hard to build such companies. Okay, most are interested in just uh, the valuation game, which is a pity. But somewhere, uh, but you know, I'm very optimistic. I think. You know, if you'll see what happened in cricket, <clears throat> India was a sort of a middling cricket nation for 50 years. And then we started democratizing cricket. So it became not just for the English speaking elite. You had people like Dhoni and all come in from small town India, Hindi speaking or not, not English speaking. And that drew in a profound amount of talent. And India really became sort of number one, number two, when we got a much larger number of people playing the sport and entering the game. And I think the same thing is going to happen in entrepreneurship. It's going to broaden and become more democratic. It's not just going to be IITNs building these things in five cities, it's going to spread and spread and spread. And we're trying to make that happen in my organization called Game. And as that happens, I think some stunning companies and stunning entrepreneurs are going to come from the most unlikely places. I'd say don't look at this as a point in time. You see this as a movie playing out. I'm way more optimistic. Lovely. Thank you. I, I think it's a great framing of how we look at what's happening as in, like you said, a point in time. But something to watch, something to be really thoughtful about as well, because you're essentially staking your reputation that you spoke of earlier when you make choices and decisions. And so how much better informed can you be when you make whatever choices? You make. But many more of the, you should be out there building the next Infosys. All right, let's move to the next question then. <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's why I don't get invited back by HR. <laughs> well, look, you said be the entrepreneur of your career. I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. We'll, we'll yeah. keep it at your career for now, but you're right. Even within our organization, what's the next thing we think of building or developing that will really change the game? is really fair challenge and you know our CEO has brought that up very many times. There's someone here who is probably speaking for many others. I only see six likes, but I want to say there are probably 6,000 likes, which is what are some tips, some of your tips to network effectively within an organization as an introvert? And I'm smiling because I know this is true for a lot of people out there. Yeah, well, that's a good question because I, I remain an introvert, uh, <clears throat> but one of the things I find is I've managed to remain curious, okay? So I'm interested in not just many things, I'm interested in everything. And what that allows me to do is 
find something interesting to talk about with every person. Okay, so when we think about how you and I met, and I use this as a very personal example, right? So we live roughly in the same neighborhood, but I used to see this lady who was injecting a dog every day with something. I came up to you and I said, hey, what are you doing? Okay, I found it very curious. What? This is a stray dog, it's not your dog. And you, know, and you said, well, I'm giving it insulin because this poor thing is diabetic. And that's how we started a conversation. And then we grew to be friends, okay? So I find something interesting in everybody. And I, over, I try to overcome my innate shyness to at least explore that. And that results in a meaningful conversation. So, for instance, I'll find as a young person, Narayan Murthy, I'm listening to him. And after that, I'll go up and I'll stand in line and I'll say, Mr. Murthy, I found that point really, really interesting and talk to him about it. And he, he'll, he'll realize, oh, here's an interesting young man, he's actually quite curious and bright. And that allows me then to email him later and say, thank you for that. It really made my day. That's how you create a hook. But the hook is not fake. It's based on genuine interest and genuine curiosity. That has worked really well for me. Okay. The other thing is you have to overcome your inhibition saying, oh, will they talk to me? Okay, why would they be interested in even, uh, you know, replying? Maybe they won't, but you'll never know. You know, as they say, you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So sure, you know, may not work out that that person shows any interest in you, but equally the, the, uh, the, it may. So I think you should put all this and inhibition and insecurity and fear of, embarrassment and rejection aside and just have have an honest interesting conversation with another human being and you shouldn't let hierarchy come in the way you know so i've gone and spoken to some of the most unlikely people way before i was somewhat successful and eight times out of ten it, it resulted in wonderful outcomes and friendships and yeah. mentors oh, i love and, that idea you know, it ties back so well to what you said earlier about contrived schmoozing type of conversations. There's something that's real. I think the other is there's a lot of sometimes anxiety about how long should this conversation be? Should it be about the hot topic of today so I can show how much I know? That's so stressful. It's a non-starter almost. See, you're not being authentic. Mm -hmm. See, you're, you're trying to be artificial and the other person is going to smell that in an instant. Here's the schmoozer who just wants to meet me because I'm important. But if you actually talk about something that's interesting and interesting to him or her and to you, yeah, then it's going to go somewhere, somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's true. Thank you. That's lovely. I hope everyone else who says I'm an introvert and I'm sure you know it or you don't, I hope this was helpful. There's another one around the same kinds of, you know, feelings of, of anxiety and we've got, 12 more, more than that number of people, Nirmal Kumar is asking, you know, you talked about the uncertainty of not having a bird in hand, so to speak, when you left Microsoft. And I think this question came up, which is how did you deal with that? What he's written out is fear of uncertainty or not having your next gig lined up. What was going on in your mind? How did you deal with that? It's a wonderful question. So in fact, in 2013, I wrote a series in the Economic Times, a five part, uh, series called Crossing the Chasm, which I talked about leaving Microsoft and finding my sort of own feet. And um, I encourage you to Google that and go back because it got well over a million readers because it was so honest and it's everybody's journey. It wasn't. And there are many issues with this. Most important one is of identity. Oh, if I'm not a vice president of Adobe, then who am I? Okay. So uh, the problem is when you work in these wonderful organizations, you conflate your identity with the organization. And so when you try to unplug, you, you have this, who am I? 
So for years, my business card was just Ravi Venkatesan. There was no organization, nothing. It was just me, email, phone number. Okay. And you have to get comfortable with that about being nobody. The, there's also this, this exploration. You're on an, on an adventure. You don't know how it's going to play out. You don't even know whether it's going to play out well or not. And the only thing you know is you're going to try many things. Most won't work out. Some things will. And you have to get comfortable after years of certainty. Okay, when you work in an organization like yours, so much that you take for granted, so much that's stable. Okay, now suddenly you've, you're out there in the jungle exploring. And so you have to get comfortable with uncertainty and risk taking and not know where this path may lead. So, you know, I write about this in the book. You know, people can look at my resume and say, oh, Ravi is so successful. What is not on my resume is the many things I tried that didn't work out. Okay. And those are not failures. Those were experiments. So you have to get comfortable with that. Uh, I can give a long list of what I tried in 2010, 11, 12, 13 that did not work out. What you only see when Amrita introduces me is what worked. Okay. So that's another one. These things are much easier if you have a supportive network. So for instance, if your spouse or partner is supportive, it's much easier to take these risks. If your partner is saying, what's wrong with you? Stay put. Okay. It's much, much harder to unplug. If you don't have a couple of friends who are also encouraging you to dream and take risks, it's much harder. But look, one more thing I'll say. When you look back at your life, when you're 70 or even 80, when you look back, you won't, what you, most people regret is not taking more risk. Rarely do they say, oh, I feel bad that, you know, I tried this and it didn't work out. You forget that. Your regrets are all about, I should have swung more for the fences in whatever way that means. Okay, I should have been more adventurous. I should have taken more risk. So time to do that is now. Lovely. I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure you're reading all of the comments, but there's plenty of this is amazing. These are the great, greatest tips I got. Thank you. This is the line for the week. I can make sure I share all of this stuff with you. Um, I know we just have a couple of minutes, but, you know, there is a question here, which I think is something you and I also spoke about. Vinod has asked this question, which is, is success a measurement of happiness? And what's your point of view on this? Chapter seven. That's the exact topic. So, you know, it's very easy, particularly for very bright, high achieving individuals to conflate success with happiness. Because, and I, I speak from personal experience, for the first 45 years of my life, I had a very simple theory that more achievement will lead to more success and reward, which lead, makes me happy. And then at 45, I realized that I'm working harder and harder. There are some successes, but it's not giving me any joy anymore. And so I said, okay, if success no longer is leading to happiness, and by the way, I think I'm successful, but I look around me and I see Shantanu Narayan and Satya Nadella and I feel like a failure. So success has got this intrinsic problem that it is relative and also very fleeting. Right? Who's Bishan Singh Bedi? Oh my God. I don't know who's Bishan Singh Bedi. So, but the point is, people are going to ask who's Shantanu Narayan in 10 years. So this whole thing of success is very, very ephemeral and you need to um, go past it to begin to un unpack what happiness truly is. And so in a nutshell, what I realized through a lot of studying and experiments is happiness actually is a state of mind. It has nothing to do with what's happening around you and whether you're successful or seen as successful or whatever. It is a uh, psychologist use a term called synthetic. It is produced by your mind. So both happiness and its opposite, misery, are manufactured by the mind. 
So you can have everything and be miserable. You can have nothing and be joyous. Okay. And so you have to learn to control your mind. That's kind of job number one. Number two is you're happiest when you're not thinking about yourself. When you're, for instance, when you are completely immersed in something that could be a game of tennis or writing code or building something beautiful in Adobe and you lost track of time and you lost track of yourself is when you're happiest. The more you're thinking me, me, me is when you're unhappy. So to find purpose into which you can lose yourself is very, very, very crucial to happiness. And the third and final thing I'll say is, look, in life, things are going to happen to you that you don't wish for. And learning to cultivate acceptance is very, very crucial. And I quote the wonderful actor Irfan Khan, right, who's laughing as he's dying. And he says, and says, well, hey, how come you're so happy? Because life is under no obligation to give you what you expect. Okay. So um, cultivating that equanimity where you accept what you know, life throws at you is, I think, also a very important. So the whole thing I'm talking about is actually a very spiritual approach. And you did, but look, first you have to get to a point of success. So this all happens in the second half of your life. So if you're 35 and still climbing hard, enjoy that ride. Okay, nothing wrong with it. It's only when you turn 45 and you get that midlife crisis that you need to think about all this. Well, I was really worried you would start naming numbers and I would have to start identifying with them and wondering whether I should be worried or happy. But thank you. That was really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, um, Ravi. I'm thank sure you. we could go on longer. There's over 20 odd questions in the chat pod. We probably got to about six or seven. But thank you very much for your time um, and for sharing your perspective. I think what everyone's consistently also sharing is how practical, unique and relatable the things you're saying are, and maybe even setting some of us free in the way we think about, you know, so many things. And you can see that popping up in the chat pod. I also want to share with all of you that Ravi's been very generous, and he's actually donating his speaker fee to the Parikrama Foundation in Bangalore that we support. And it's a great example of paying it forward. Thank you for that, Ravi. Yeah, I want to say yeah, thank you to all of you for this. Because I no longer charge speaker fees. I raise money for charities by speaking. So 100% um, of whatever organizations give goes directly to charities, not through me. And I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for being generous towards Parikrama. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. I think you told me this once before. You said at some point you can't be a taker all the time. You need to be able to give. This is a great example. And thank you for setting that tone. Yeah, and I think we should end on that note. I, I really want every one of us to reflect on, at the end of the day, am I more of a giver or am I more of a taker? Okay, And I, I do think that as we get older, the, you know, being more of a giver is highly correlated with a sense of satisfaction and happiness and so forth. And uh, by the way, there's a beautiful book by Adam Grant with just this title, Givers and Takers. And he says, by, when you look at successful people, way more of them are givers than the selfish takers. So look at the evidence as well. But anyway, good luck. Thank you again for having me here. Uh, Amrita, you're missing your calling as a wonderful uh, interlocutor. Uh, you did a fabulous <laughs> job. Uh, and thank, I, you. thank you for having me here. And Thanks, those of you who want to continue this, see, I'll see you on LinkedIn. Bye-bye. That's right. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.